the fourth seeds conference in 2024 will be a milestone for our joint implementing of the SDGs. EU and its member states fully support the preparatory process and at the conference itself. The EU was glad to engage in the three regional preparatory meetings in Mauritius, St. Vincent the Grenadines, Tonga, and the interregional preparatory meeting in Cabo Verde at the beginning of September. First and foremost, the fourth SEEDS conference will be a conference by the SEEDS, for the SEEDS, based on the priorities of the SEEDS. We expect the outcome document to reflect this, and we look forward to the SEEDS assessment of the implementation of the Samoa pathway, as well on how its priorities will affect the implementation of the SDGs in SEEDS. The extreme vulnerability of many SEEDS to the climate crisis is beyond any doubt. It will certainly figure as a top priority in the debate. The EU and its member states remain committed to our joint 1.5 degrees Celsius target. We are the first to have enshrined the mid-century net zero target in law, and we remain committed to the implementation of the Paris Agreement to supporting the most vulnerable countries, in particular SEEDS and LDC, and to increase collective climate financing. The EU recognizes the need for more financial resources on the path towards SDGs. We are strongly committed to be at the forefront of the collective efforts to scale up resources mobilization with a focus on low income and vulnerable countries and communities. And we recognize the specific needs of developing countries, in particular of the SEEDS. The EU's Global Gateway Initiative is the EU contribution to address the investment gap. Global Gateway has become a major way in our support to our partners through sustainable infrastructure investment, coupled with soft measures to improve the business climate and regulatory environment. All of the priority areas are aligned with SDGs and will contribute to achieving SDGs worldwide. It also represents a joint effort by Team Europe, bringing together the EU, EU member states, and European financial and development institutions such as EIB. In our experience, SEEDs often struggle to attract investment due to their small markets and perceived risk. Additionally, the criteria used by international financial institutions for determining eligibility may not adequately capture the unique needs and vulnerability of SEEDs. We must be financially creative and provide solutions to address the complexity of SEEDs challenges. We recognize the need for action to tackle debt sustainability, and we are following the ongoing discussion in multilateral fora on the reform of the international financial architecture to increase liquidity and improve access to concessional financing. The current international financial architecture is not fit for purpose anymore. It needs a revamping to properly support our partners, especially those most affected by climate change and to achieve the 2030 agenda. And it must provide adequate solutions to the debt crisis faced by partner countries and lead to an increased mobilization of private finance to fill the investment gap. Increased coordination between MDBs and with other international organizations, such as the IMF and the UN system, is also crucial without creating new structures or systems. We will continue to engage with all partners in all fora to ensure progress on this reform agenda. As emphasized in the Paris Summit for a new global financing pact in July, no country should ever have to choose between eradicating poverty, furthering its green transition, and fighting, fighting climate change. The EU is committed to this goal. As Team Europe, we are the leading donors of official development assistance. Team Europe is also the biggest donor when it comes to climate finance. Our main contribution to the SDGs comes from the Global Gateway Strategy, which provides partner countries with a quality EU offer, leveraging joint interest and advancing common objectives and bringing public and private financial flows to achieve a total, total investment of EU 30 billion before 2027. Regarding our relation with FAO, the European Green Deal principles and objectives with its emphasis on moving towards a carbon neutral 
neutral and sustainable model in Europe and worldwide serves as the core driver for cooperation with FAO. The global food security effects of the war in Ukraine underline the importance of enhancing sustainable food systems, resilient value chains, and diversification. FAO and the EU must continue to work around common priorities on climate change, mitigation and adaptation, biodiversity, and natural resources management, including sustainable forest management and halting deforestation, sustainable food system and food security, sustainable fisheries and agriculture, sustainable value chains and resilience to food crisis. Cooperation will also continue on making agricultural investments sustainable and ensuring that global food systems are robust, resilient, sustainable and inclusive. Nutrition, food safety and gender-sensitive gender approaches should remain among the partnership's top priorities. The EU is ready to cooperate intensively with FAO and the UN family in the preparation of the fourth SIDS conference to ensure that it will be a milestone for our joint implementing of the SDGs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ibañez, and uh, allow us to congratulate you for your appointment. This is, uh, as we say in Spanish, enhorabuena. Uh, uh, thank you for reiterating EU's uh, constant support and commitment to SIDS, including uh, in the upcoming uh, SIDS conference, uh, issues related to climate change, and also in the areas of resource mobilization through, among others, the Global Gateway and other initiatives. Uh, you also highlighted in your intervention um, your important collaboration with FAO to ensure uh, the transformation of agri-food food systems to render them more efficient, inclusive, sustainable, and resilient. Thank you very much. And now I have uh, the pleasure to uh, pass the floor to Ms. Christelle Pratt, Assistant Secretary General, Environment and Climate Action Department at OACPS. And I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the OACPS for hosting the SID Solutions Dialogue here today. And now over to you, Christelle. Thank you very much, um, moderator Angelica. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, all protocols observed. A very good morning and good afternoon, and welcome to this hybrid event, which the OACPS is pleased to host here at OACPS headquarters in Brussels, and to, um, of sorts, co-organise with the FAO. Uh, your liaison officers in Brussels, um, Michelle, thank you very much, um, in New York and Geneva. We have a long-standing uh, and valued um, relationship with the FAO, um, and we um, appreciate this very much. This event seeks to highlight the embracing of a food systems approach as a solution uh, to addressing malnutrition, reducing the growing burden of obesity and related non-communicable diseases, NCDs. Food and nutritional security is an important priority for 39 uh, SIDS members of the OACPS. Our members and communities continue to grapple with the increasing levels of malnutrition uh, in its many facets, which have led to the rising incidence of obesity and the increasing burden of NCDs. It must be acknowledged and emphasised that the undesirable malnutrition levels and its consequences are primarily due to the unique vulnerabilities and specificities of SIDS. As many will be aware, local food production in many SIDS is constrained by their small size, lack of arable land, limited fresh water resources, and high vulnerability to natural hazard risks, fragile natural environments and ecosystems, and increasing exposure to the effects of climate change, including saltwater intrusion and sea level rise. In the face of declining domestic food production and changing dietary preferences, reliance on imported food plays a larger role in food and nutritional security for most SIDS. Oftentimes, these imported foods are highly processed and are a key driver of, of obesity and NCDs in uh, SIDS populations. While SIDS have demonstrated re remarkable resilience despite their limited resources and geographical constraints, there is no denying that SIDS face difficulties 
ahead if they are to build and maintain healthy and resilient communities in the face of ongoing crises from a multitude of exogenous shocks. Improving health through increasing the production and consumption of local nutritious food remain a policy objective of many SIDS governments. However, achieving this objective is not without major hurdles. Consider this. A typical fresh produce farmer in SIDS tends to be a small holder, tends to be underfunded, and tends to have limited farmland. But he or she has to face stiff competition from relatively cheap and heavily subsidised processed imports from industrial agricultural systems from developed countries. Coupled with the frequent uh, disasters from natural hazard risks and climate change and from economic downturns, it is critical to emphasise the urgent need for tailored support that is commensurate with the unique circumstances to support locally-led sustainable solutions to produce healthy foods from local sources. The recent exogenous shocks stemming from the Russian-Ukraine war has demonstrated the need for sustainable regional food value chains to ensure food security. Therefore, we need to redouble efforts to include small holder farmers and artisanal fishers in modern food value chains. This would secure rural incomes and food security in rural and urban areas. Small producers face many challenges that can undermine their attempts to harvest and market their goods effectively. Policies and mechanisms that support them in this regard will be indispensable to encourage their productivity and market participation. The food systems approach is an attractive proposition for SIDS. It would provide viable, locally informed and adaptable pathways for increasing locally produced nutritious food. It would ensure food and nutritional security and build resilient communities. In this regard, the OACPS supports and promotes transformative food production approaches that positively impact the environment to ensure to ensure productive resilience and is based on the best available scientific information and traditional knowledge. Ongoing intra-ACP 11th EDF programs, such as the Fish for ACP program, is leading in supporting fisheries value chains development in 12 OACPS countries, including two SIDS members. To underline our commitment to this effort, the OACPS is exploring the feasibility of establishing a food systems transformation mechanism to promote coordinated actions at all levels to end hunger and malnutrition in all its forms and to transform food systems to meet our health needs while embracing the principles of sustainable management, use and conservation of our continents, our islands and our oceans. The fourth SIDS conference in Antigua and Barbuda is an opportunity to put all hands on deck, including our long-standing partners, such as FAO, to support in shaping the sustainable development of both our green and blue food systems. To end hunger, food insecurity and malnutrition in all its forms, and build resistance resilient communities against the climate emergency that is afflicting our SIDS countries and communities. Thank you for your attention. Good evening. Thank you very much, ASG Pratt, um, for sharing your thoughts um, and, and for highlighting um, the dependence of food imports, uh, often um, for very processed foods. Um, some of the hurdles faced by smallholder farmers, along with the general vulnerabilities of SIDS to external shocks, um, the importance of including uh, smallholder farmers and include artisanal fish fishers and the support that's given from OACPS and FAO um, through initiatives such as Fish for ACP and for um, calling uh, uh, on all of us to um, to bring bring to bear our best at the SIDS conference in 2024. 
it is now uh, my pleasure to, uh, to uh, pass the floor to Her Excellency Nella Pepa Tavite Levi, Chair of the Alliance of Small Island Developing States and Ambassador of the Independent State of Samoa to the Government of Switzerland. Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam Facilitator. Good afternoon, uh, colleagues, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Talo Falava and good afternoon, good morning to others uh, from the other side of the world, including my country, Samoa. Um, for Samoa, we have been blessed to have the surrounding ocean uh, providing us with food sustenance. We have wonderful tropical weather and there are no disasters. And we've been also blessed with fertile vol volcanic soil for crops. And if you have been to Samoa or have the opportunity to visit our shores, you would notice beginning from the right from the airport, uh, small holder plots and family gardens of food and vegetables, uh, both in the rural and urban areas. Uh, food availability should not be an issue for us. However, as we've heard uh, from past uh, speakers, that the rising incidence of NCDs, especially diabetes and obesity, uh, it is apparent that access to nutritious and good quality food is the main concern. NCDs have become an urgent concern as Samoa and many other small island developing states who, who share unique characteristics now have a high premature mortality rate. For the Pacific, the rising burden of NCDs represent the single largest cause of premature mortality. Food security for SIDS is at a critical stage. External shocks, including conflicts, have wreaked havoc across global supply chains. The COVID-19 pandemic exacerbated the vulnerability of SIDS, to which we are still recovering from its social economic impacts and the adverse effects of climate change is worsening. Higher temperatures, altered rainfall patterns, sea level rise, salinization, and freshwater shortages build unpredictability for crop productions at fish stocks. As a result, there has been an increasing reliance on imported processed foods, as we've heard, which are accessible, cheap, but low in nutrition and often high in calories. The ocean is central to the way of life for small island developing states or ocean states. It provides a wide range of ecosystem services, food and nutrition, and decent jobs and livelihoods. However, the ocean and its resources are under considerable stress from human actions, marine litter and plastic pollution, hazardous toxic waste and greenhouse gas emissions. EOSIS leaders have recognized the strong connection between the ocean and climate change and the need to further strengthen ocean climate action under the Paris Agreement. To address these challenges, SIDS require quality data to formulate evidence-based policy that could guide action-oriented implementation that is tailored to the specific needs and context of SIDS. There's a need for targeted measures to enable self-reliance in terms of food production and responsible consumption. Notwithstanding, there's an opportunity to strengthen and transform food systems food system pathways, and rejuvenate traditional agri-food systems to correct the, the nutritional deficiencies and counteract the prevalence of NCDs. Strength and partnerships is imperative in this regard, especially at the upcoming fourth International Conference on SIDS, which will be held next year in Antigua and Barbuda. Our challenges require new, innovative, and bold approaches Building resilience in SIDS is paramount to the survival of our land and people in the era of human-induced climate change. Simplified access to financing, sustainable investments, and removal of barriers to technology transfers are a few solutions that have been adamantly called for by SIDS. Access to a balanced and nutritional diet and the return to locally produced food and fresh and locally produced and fresh food can be supported by financial assistance for advocacy, for a change behavioral mindset and lifestyle and capacity building for our health and education professionals. 
The System Summit and SID Solutions Forum can further foster cooperation, collaboration, and innovation, uh, especially in agri-food systems, which can help diversify island economies um, and implement the Samo pathway and achieve the 2030 SDGs. Lastly, production and productivity related to food should not be achieved at the expense of the environment. The protection of the environment and its biodiversity, ocean conservation and climate resilience are integral to the sustainability of food systems and can harness our full capacity as ocean-based and agricultural economies. I thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Excellency. Um, for um, stressing uh, the rising uh, burden of NCDs in the Pacific and, and sharing with us how SIDS are still recovering from the impacts of COVID-19 and constantly confront um, the threat of climate change um, with its impacts on food security and nutrition. Um, Ambassador, you also mentioned the issue of quality data, the role of the transformation of agri-food systems, uh, strengthening of partnerships, uh, more financing and capacity building as we move towards a new decade of action for SIDS and towards achieving the SDGs. I now uh, have the pleasure uh, to introduce Ms. Nancia Burto, uh, the Deputy Director of the Food and Nutrition Division in FAO headquarters in Rome, even though she's not actually in Rome today. Nancy, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Angelica. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, today I have the privilege of discussing this matter of profound global significance that the introductions have brought to the table, and that is the intersection of nutrition, climate change, and diet-related non-communicable diseases in the SIDS. Now, the convergence of these issues is not only compelling, but it's deeply concerning, given the unique vulnerabilities and challenges faced by SIDS, particularly in relation to access to and demand for healthy diets for all. Now, starting with the biggest of pictures, the indisputable evidence of the negative impacts of climate change on the planet, on nations, communities, households, and people's lives combined with the persistent challenges of malnutrition affecting every country in the world and one of three individuals globally, makes it fair to say that climate change and malnutrition are two of the world's greatest barriers to sustainable development. And as our introductory speakers have already said, the SIDS are in a particular situation when it comes to the threat of climate change and the challenges of malnutrition. As Mr. Ibanez said, that the challenge of climate change in SIDS is real today. And there is a strong commitment to tackle the multiple challenges that could indeed have devastating consequences for all SIDS nations. While Ms. Pratt mentioned the complex prevalence of multiple forms of malnutrition in SIDS, the triple burden of undernutrition, micronutrient deficiency, and obesity. While at the same time, Her Excellency Tavita Levy mentioned that common burden of high levels of NCDs in the SIDS. And perhaps one thing that we haven't mentioned that also deserves a call out is that many SIDS countries have an economic context at both the national and the household level that confers unique challenges. So in summary, the SIDS are facing complex, unique, and intertwined challenges in reaching the sustainable development goals. And why do I put so much emphasis on that word intertwined? Well, it comes back to the evidence, and we've already touched on this as well, the need for data and evidence for approaching these problems. And that's the plethora of evidence of the relationship among climate, nutrition, and NCDs. Now, just last week at FAO, we launched a paper entitled Climate Action and Nutrition, Pathways to Impact, where we documented the evidence of specific impacts of climate change and its consequences on the systems that underpin good nutrition. And as we learn more about these interlinkages, we're elucidating the potential response options through integrated actions that can address climate change challenges and nutrition relevant outcomes simultaneously and thus reduce the risk of NCDs. 
Now, those systems that I refer to, are, of course, are agri-food, water, social protection, and health systems. These are the underpinning systems for good nutrition. And the example, some examples of the impacts of climate change on these systems include things like higher sea levels and warmer oceans and ocean acidification negatively impacting aquatic species biodiversity and altering the distribution of wild fish stocks, particularly important in the context of SIDS. And changes in precipitation contributing to approximately half of the world's population experience severe, experiencing severe water scarcity. And perhaps ironically, the SIDS are particularly vulnerable to this water insecurity challenge. There's also an example of shocks, climate-induced shocks that are impeding communities and households' ability to invest in long-term livelihood opportunities. And as we all know, the SIDS are particularly vulnerable to those climate-induced weather events. And finally, a last example, increased outbreaks of novel illnesses such as the COVID-19 that uh, are straining our health systems and limiting their ability to deliver appropriate services and care, including those services needed for addressing non-communicable diseases, just to name a few. Now, these challenges, as well as many other not listed here but found in that paper, are negatively impacting nutrition-relevant outcomes, things like access to healthy diets, there's a reduced availability of nutritious food, but also because of these challenges to livelihoods, a reduced um, economic accessibility. There's also altered water intake and physiological water balance caused by water scarcity and by extreme heat events. There's an increased implementation of maladaptation or negative coping strategies. Everything from community actions such as overfishing for short-term gain, to household or personal actions, such as changing our quality of diet, or even things like removing children from school. And finally, there's increased food safety risk. This can often occur in the context of floods or droughts that increase water contamination. And these nutrition impacts, combined with other direct impacts of climate change, not going through that nutrition pathway, increase the risk of multiple types of non-communicable diseases. And now focusing in on that overlay of climate, nutrition, and NCD, in this regard, it is not all bad news because the evidence reveals a range of areas where addressing climate change and malnutrition simultaneously can have mutually reinforcing positive impacts on both. Our review of the evidence was encouraging in finding there are multiple entry points across those four systems for potential positive impact on nutrition and climate outcomes. In recognizing that strong relationship between diet, nutrition, and non-communicable disease makes these integrated actions highly relevant for identifying triple win opportunities. So let me just walk you through one example of integrated action from each of the systems. And I want you to note that on these slides, there are references all over the slides that make the visual a little bit busy, but I really wanna reinforce that everything I'm saying here is backed by evidence in the literature. Now from the agri-food system, an example of integrated action is managing soil sustainably, which is extremely relevant for SIDS. And I believe it will indeed be touched on by a following speaker. Managing soil sustainably can reduce soil degradation and strengthen ecosystems resilience. But at the same time, it can also simultaneously improve product production and enhance nutrient levels in crops and in food supply chains. However, I also need to highlight that we recognize that the results are not guaranteed. And though I, I don't have time today to jump into all the specifics, I do wanna note that in the, the paper, we talk about some of those key enablers that are supportive of these integrated actions having the successful outcomes that we desire. In the case of water systems, an example of integrated action is enabling gender responsive water sanitation and hygiene or WASH. This can strengthen climate change preparedness and resilience while also ensuring water and sanitation for all while also reducing discrimination and violence against women and girls. For social protection systems, another example is also gender focused. 
employing a gender transformative approach that focuses on justice and equity and recognizes the social context that prevent women and girls from reaching their full potential while also recognizing their nutritional vulnerability can reduce the use of negative coping strategies and maladaptation practices while also reducing the vulnerability of women and girls to nutritional uh, malnutrition and improving household care and health. And finally, for health systems, an example of integrated action is increasing the availability, timeliness, and utilization of data on health risk from climate change and on geographical and individual vulnerabilities. This includes data on things like health status, water availability and water quality, and weather data. And this can lead to improved identification of potential vulnerabilities to climate change impacts and more effective adaptation measures, while also leading to a reorganized health system that enables essential functions, including those essential functions for addressing non-communicable disease, such as appropriate preventative care and family and patient counseling. So overall, there is indeed clear potential for each of these systems to be nutrition sensitive and climate smart for healthy diets, safe food, clean water, enhanced coping, and less illness from systems that significantly reduce overall greenhouse gas emissions, protect biodiversity, preserve natural resources, and increase resilience, resulting in a virtuous cycle of healthier people and stronger communities with reduced vulnerability that can drive sustainable development. So in summary, SIDS face complex, unique and intertwined challenges to re reach the SDGs. And our research has shown that these intertwined challenges provide a great opportunity. The inner linkages between climate, nutrition and NCDs across agri-food, water, social protection and health systems provide multiple entry points for integrated action that can positively impact climate, nutrition, and NCDs. And evidence response options are available. And we will hear from today's panel about some that are underway in SIDS today. And we can work together to expand these actions and take them to a larger scale. But in order to do that, we need to catalyze, mobilize, connect, and advocate for these integrated climate and nutrition actions. And this is the aim of the Initiative on Climate Action and Nutrition, a multi-stakeholder, multi-sectorial, global flag flagship program launched by the government of Egypt as the COP27 president. Ladies and gentlemen, business as usual will not be sufficient to reach the ambitious goals of Agenda 2030. And as Her Excellency Tavita Levy already said, we must embrace innovative, bolder approaches. We need to embrace new partnerships, alliances, and innovative action and policy to find those efficient solutions to address multiple national and global priorities simultaneously. And as the research I just presented has shown, there are multiple options to take a systems approach to do just that, to address climate change, malnutrition, and NCDs simultaneously, and thus catalyze our progress towards sustainable development. And with that, I thank you for your time and attention and invite you to download our paper to learn more. Back over to you, Angelica. For highlighting the, the complex, unique, and intertwined challenges SIDS face, and here by showing us a clear example of the intersection between climate change, nutrition, and NCDs. Um, sharing with us um, something that was mentioned um, by the previous speakers on um, the importance of data and evidence, and here pointing to the launch of the climate action and nutrition pathways to impact. Um, then further sharing how um, climate uh, impact systems impact nutrition, and then following it also contributes to the risk of NCDs. Um, however, you also gave us a positive uh, note uh, showing an opportunity um, that can be had by one intervention in one in one area having positive outcomes on, on the other areas. Um, you also shared with us some key enablers, which are further elaborated in the paper um, that was mentioned. 
and provided some examples. And lastly, you mentioned the ICANN initiative. Uh, it is now uh, my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Ms. Maud Verrier-Picot, Regional Lead for Africa and the Near East from the uh, Office of Climate Change and Biodiversity Jeff Coordination Unit at FAO, who will brief us about Cabo Verde's climate resilient food and nutrition solutions for land degradation neutrality goals. Maud, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Angelica and distinguished colleagues for setting the scene to this event. I'm grateful uh, for the opportunity to speak about climate and environment funding and healthy and nutritious diets, focusing specifically on the FAO Jeff experience in Capo Verde. So the Global Environment Facility, or the Jeff, was created now over three decades ago to support developing countries deliver their environment and their climate commitments under a number of multilateral environmental agreements, including the Rio Conventions. Since then, the GEF has provided more than 23 billion US dollars worth of grants to over 5,000 different projects, including in very many sits across the world that address biodiversity loss, climate change, adaptation and mitigation challenges, pollution, and also land and ocean health. And with the years and a growing integrated nature and complexity of development challenges, the Jeff's agenda became more holistic, more transformational and more people-centered. Indeed, and this was illustrated nicely in the previous presentation by Ms. Nancy, uh, the effect, the, to effectively address the climate crisis and the interlinked crisis of rising food and nutrition insecurity, youth unemployment, biodiversity loss, ecosystem degradation, we need integrated solutions and we have integrated solutions. Furthermore, with its Healthy Planet, Healthy People framework, the GEF is putting human health and well-being at the center of its strategy. FAO is a key partner of the GEF, and as a GEF agency, FAO has helped over 140 developing countries, including SITS in Africa, in the Pacific, and in the Caribbean, to mobilize close to 2 billion um, US dollars in GEF grants. This FAO GEF portfolio has been championing integrated approaches to tackle the complex challenges at the nexus between agri-food systems and the environment. Indeed, the way we produce and consume food has a great impact on the environment and dietary patterns are influenced by agri-food systems, but they also shape supply systems with different environmental footprints. In this regard, FAO recognizes the role of healthy diets as levers for transformative actions and this across food systems to improve on one hand human health and on the other hand planetary health jointly. So allow me to share the experience from Capo Verde to illustrate what this means in concrete terms. Land degradation is widespread and increasing in Capo Verde and it significantly impacts rural livelihoods but also food security and nutrition, and the island's fragile environment altogether. Management responses, mainly uh, constituting of soil erosion control measures, they have been inadequate and insufficient. So since early 2022, FAO has been working closely with the Ministry of Agriculture and Environment of Capo Verde to develop and launch a GEF co-finance project to reverse this downward trend. The FAO GEF project contributes to the achievement of Capo Verde's land degradation neutrality targets. Now, land degradation neutrality provides an integrated framework to sustainably manage land resources and their ecosystem services in a given landscape. The LDN framework, land degradation neutrality framework, 
thanks to its holistic and integrated nature, is therefore also seen as a potential accelerator for the achievement of several SDGs and development priorities, such as food security and nutrition. The Land Degradation Neutrality Project in Capo Verde therefore actively promotes the widespread adoption of nature-based solutions at the farm and the landscape levels to deliver land productivity, soil erosion, soil carbon and land cover benefits, all essential um, to in order to produce more and better. Um, examples of such nature-based solutions um, include the introduction of living barriers um, along contour lines and this to stabilize soils, to recharge groundwater, uh, increase vegetation cover, just to name a few. Uh, other examples include the organic matter management, such as mulching and composting, or another example is agroforestry with food trees. So the LDN framework delivers societal benefits alongside this environmental land soil health uh, and land degradation control uh, benefits, including improved climate resilience, um, improved, sorry, climate resilient food production and nutrition. Healthy and nutritious diets are thus an essential co-benefit of the environment action that is undertaken by the project. But the opposite is equally true too. The project uses a gender and nutrition sensitive approach to value chain development and therefore explicitly recognizing the transformational nature of healthy diets to deliver LDN benefits at scale. So coming back to our nature-based solutions and the agroforestry with fruit trees example, the project is committed to developing the mango value chain, for instance, um, improvements at the production, the transformation, the commercialization end of the food value chain will benefit the rural women that are engaged in this food value chain as they earn a better living. But these improvements will also benefit the school going children that will find healthy, local and season fresh alternatives to imported foods, sometimes highly processed, as was mentioned before, in their school canteens. Um, I left you with a little bit more information and details on the project uh, as these presentations will be uh, with you, will be shared with you afterwards. Um, and equipped with the example of Capo Verde and many more experiences from the FAO Jeff projects and programs, FAO took stock of successes, tools and approaches that enhance nutrition sensitivity in Jeff programming. The recently launched publication that you find here um, features concrete recommendations to GEF partner agencies and GEF project proponents wishing to accelerate the delivery of climate and environment benefits while also at the same time enhancing access to healthy diets and durable and resilient livelihoods, which are truly nurtured by healthy and productive ecosystems. Thank you, and I wish you a fruitful discussion ahead. Reiterating uh, that integrated uh, or intertwined challenges require integrated solutions. And here you've also shared with us a, a bit about the FAO Jeff portfolio, highlighting the specific example of Cabo Verde and the use of nature based solutions. Uh, with uh, that are both nutrition and gender sensitive to reverse land degradation and how it impacts different issues, uh, including food security, nutrition. It also allows to, for the empowerment of rural women and benefit uh, young children of school age. It is now uh, my pleasure to move to the next speaker, Mr. Sean Baugh, Program Manager, Agriculture and Agro Industrial Development from the CARICOM Secretariat, who will brief us about CARICOM's Agri-Food System Strategy 25 by 2025, aiming to reduce the region's U.S. $5 billion food import bill by 25% 20, by 2025. Uh, Mr. Bond, uh, the floor is yours. Can I, um, no, I'm I have 
Excuse me, someone has their microphone on. Please mute your microphone. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure, certainly, to be at this forum. Um, certainly, I've learned a lot just listening from the previous presenters. Um, I have the honor of, of giving some information on the our Vision 25 by 25, which is a, a food security, food and nutrition security prioritization initiative that the CARICOM region has to reduce, as the as was said before, our growing food import bill, which is around five billion US annually. Let me start by just giving a background as to what CARICOM is. CARICOM is made up of 20 countries, 15 full members and five associate members. CARICOM came about in, in 1979 under the, the Treaty of Shagaramas. Our, our existence um, is built on four main areas. One, economic integration. Two, foreign policy coordination. Three, human and social development. And four, security. Specifically dealing with agriculture, it's in our treaty which sets up agriculture, which is the Treaty of Shagaramas. It's from Article 56 to 50, 61. And the agricultural areas which are which are focused on deals with the implement and implementation of the community agricultural policy, natural resource management, marketing of agricultural products, fisheries management and development, forestry management and development. I think it's important to 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 talk about some of the, the food and nutrition security facts which face us here in the CARICOM region. Firstly, over 40% of the seeds in the world are in the Caribbean. And let me say that again. Over 40% of the seeds that are in the world are in the Caribbean. As said before, our region, our annual food import bill is just around 5 billion. Except for two countries, most of our countries rely heavily on importing food. Only two countries are net food importers. And the other member states import in excess of 80% of the food that are consumed. Our region has the highest costs for a healthy diet and also have high incidence of NCDs. We are highly dependent on import for our very basic food, wheat, dairy, meat, animal, and a range of processed food. A recent survey that we conducted in collaboration with the World Food Program indicates that 3.7 million out of the 7.1 persons in the English-speaking Caribbean are food insecure. We also face with rising food prices, increasing inflation, which continues to negatively affect the food security position of the region. And finally, which is up on us, up on us and creating havoc in our region, climate change is also severely affecting food production and food productivity. This within the agricultural sector. Now, as a region, we have recognized this and we've decided that we have to do something to manage and stem these negative um, incidents that are happening as related really to food security, climate change, and the challenges that it brings to our population. Now, our heads of government decided to put in place what is called a Vision 25 by 25, which is a reduction in the region's food import bill. What it is? It's a long-term social and economic partnership between our member states, regional private sector, regional organization, producer group, civil society, and our development partners. It outlines the actions and critical areas of intervention to tackle, in, to tackle and to reduce our food import bill, one, to improve intra-regional trade, to create wealth and economic opportunity for every member, every citizen within every member state. This is led by what is called a special ministerial task force on food production and food security, and we call it MTF for short. The MTF is made up of ministers of agriculture from the entire CARICOM region. The duty of the MTF is one to guide the transformation of our agri-food system into one that is resilient, provides attractive and sustainable wealth creation opportunities for potential investors and guarantees food and nutrition security for member states. The priority areas 
as listed here has to do with the removal of barriers to access markets being faced by the sector, securing private sector investment and the priority action treating with that is policy development and policy implementation that fosters and promotes greater food security and food production. Two, provision of alternative financing and insurance for the sector and the priority action listed there is de-risking of the agricultural sector. And de-risking here is not the traditional financial um, context, but it's looking at ensuring how do we treat with the effects of climate change, planning, having different um, early warning systems. How do we get agricultural insurance, which is hard to get in the region? How do we get new sources of financing that isn't as onerous as the traditional sources? Two, treating with, three, treating with the, challenge that we have with transportation and logistics and we seek to improve transportation and logistics through the region um, for dealing with issues dealing with cross-border investment because as a small region some member states have more land and more available resources than others and it is our goal under this 25 by 25 to have cross-border investment that creates food baskets in some member states that produce foods that can be consumed in other member states. Five, we're looking at the implementation of a e-agricultural strategy, and that deals with digitalization of the sector, and digitalization to deal with markets, digitalization to deal with the impacts of climate change, digitalization to be able to properly plan and use new tools that assist us to treat with all the challenges that we have. And fine, looking at our trade systems. And I think some of the some of our speaker before spoke about the challenges that they have treating with trade and the and the different preferential treatment that some larger countries have that put us as SIDS in a very uncomfortable position and uncompetitive position. So we're also looking at that under the 25 by 25. Here's a little bit more detail as to what it is. Uh, agricultural insurance, we're looking at regional agricultural insurance products that we want to implement. We want to establish a regional sustainable financing facility. We want to promote an attraction of cross-border investment on a policy implementation. We're looking at promotion of food and nutrition security. We're looking at implementation of operation of an operation of various um, SPS related policy. We're looking at policy improvement to enhance regional transportation and logistics. Some of us have spoken about and on a trade and e agriculture, certainly elimination or removal of trade barriers that has caused us to be challenged and food insecure. We want to look at um, increased R&D capacity building and enhancement and also technical exchange and, and resource mobilization for technical support. Now, I want to link what we're doing under the 25 by 25 with the topic here, which is healthy diets and climate resilience. And the question that we're trying to answer here, how does this 25 by 25 link into a healthy diet and climate and climate resilience? And, I, and I'll move into that now. On a healthy diet, the successful implementation of the various actions and policy direction that we have under the vision 25 by 25 one will increase production of traditional foods, which are now normally more nutritious, more beneficial, and help with the attacking and reducing some of the NCDs that we have. We're looking at the food, food the school feeding program and to introduce locally produced food to reduce the amount of highly processed foods. So we want to target the children from early to get a taste, to get a feel as to what it is to eat healthy. And we want it 25 by 25 to be producing healthy foods to be consumed. We're looking at using this to reduce a reduction in the cost of a healthy meal, or a healthy lunch, a healthy dinner, because Given the dependence that we have on imported foods, it makes it challenging in terms of reducing costs for meals and so on. So we are of the view that if we are able under the 25 by 25 initiative to produce some of these things locally, it should drive down the price. Also, we're looking at to in terms of change in the public procurement policy. 
a lot of the procurement that takes place in the public sector treats with imported foods, treats with highly processed foods. We want to make a system in place that allows us within the region to change our public procurement system that allows now for us to be purchasing highly nutritious foods, to be purchasing foods that are produced locally, and that we, we, we have the view that the 25 by 25 can do this. We want to push to, on the healthy diets to look at greater public awareness programs because the slogan that's used throughout the region is eat what you grow, grow what you eat. So we want to have a public awareness program that highlights the, 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 the 25 by 25 and it benefits, benefits certainly from the food and nutrition point of view. We want to look at how it is that we can use this 25 by 25 to reduce the consumption of highly processed foods. And that is how we're looking at the nexus between with, with our 25 by 25 and healthy diets. Now, climate resilience. Climate change and the effects of climate change is a real issue for us in the Caribbean and CARICOM. I mean, we live it. We live it. This is a reality for us. And on our 25 by 25, we're looking at how it is that we can use this program to one, increase adaptation of climate smart agricultural practices, one, two, build capacity and awareness of throughout the region within the farming sector and by extension the society as a whole. Improvement and upscaling in R and D, because we now need to have to move and have greater value added in R and D that we have appropriate research and appropriate tools and technologies that we can use to treat with climate change. We're looking at using the 25 by 25 to have livelihood preservation. And this is real for us because as now we're going through a, a, an extended heat spell and we're seeing the cost of food going up, we're seeing production going down, and livelihoods are affected by that. Now, governments seem to have to be spending more as it relates to protecting the vulnerable. We want to use the 25 by 25 to introduce technologies, tools, and systems that cause livelihood protection to take place. Environmental management, environmental and natural resource management, that's something that's big under 25 by 25 because you would um, understand the biodiversity which exists within the region. Most of our, our seeds, we have finite land and we, we're competing with urbanization, we're competing with housing, we're competing, competing with industrialization. So under the 25 by 25, environmental, environmental management and natural resource preservation is something that's heavily, heavily um, targeted. And finally, on the climate change and the nexus to our 25 by 25, is the conservation and sustainable use of the region's biological resources. And this has to do with certainly our how we use certainly our fisheries sector, how we develop our blue economy. And this is a big thing under the 25 that is sustainable, that ensures that persons who come after us have the food that we're trying to promote and have the resources in place. Now, there has been some positives so far since we really started to push from 2022 to now. We've seen um, last year 11.9 growth in to 11.9 to a 17% growth in agricultural sectors. Um, two countries being highlighted here, Jamaica and um, Guyana. We've seen increased in infrastructural investment in our member states who are listed there. Certainly every member state have started to increase the budgetary allocation to agriculture. We've seen the improve the introduction of climate smart technology. We're seeing the introduction of research facilities that deals with labs and treating with climate change. We've seen increased collaboration between our member states that never used to be at the level that we wanted it. We've seen it increasing, certainly. We've seen livestock um, investment across um, countries. We've seen private sector participation, private, private sector involvement at, at increased levels. Um, just recently, we had two major investment forums dealing with agriculture and sustainable agriculture investment treating with nutritious um, 
and nutrition as one of the headlines and also treating with climate climate change and how it is that we can have private sector investment to treat with that. And we've had two successful seminars in this month alone where private sector has been participating, private sector has been accounting for its role in climate change and responding and developing the sector. And I'll stop there given the time. I know I only have 10 minutes. I want to say thank you um, and warm for questions and so forth. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bow, and thank you for um, being cognizant of the time constraints that we have. Um, you provided a very rich overview of the uh, situation of food security and nutrition in the Caribbean. You explained how um, uh, most of the SIDS are net food importers, with the exception of two, co uh, two countries, and how seven country member countries of CARICOM um, ha uh, have, excuse me, um, import 80% of their food. You also show us how through the um, vision 25% by 2025, led by a ministerial task force, CARICOM is really taking the bull by the horns um, to try to address these challenges and how it's linked um, to positive outcomes um, in nutrition uh, and healthy diets and, and in climate change. So we thank you very much um, for that. We are running a little short on time, um, so I will uh, just look to see if there's any burning question. If not, we'll have to move um, towards our, our closing uh, segment. Um, I'm going to look here in on the floor to see if I see any hands with a burning question. And um, online, it does not seem that there is any questions, so I will now proceed um, to the part of the closing session. Um, we have the pleasure to uh, introduce His Excellency uh, Walter Alfonso Webson, permanent representative of Antigua and Barbuda, an ambassador um, to the United Nations in New York, who has prepared a pre-recorded remark, which we will play now. Please. Uh, Ambassador Webson, message. Excellencies, invited guests, friends, colleagues. It is an honor for me to address you during this dialogue regarding agro-food system approaches and the possibility that it holds in helping to achieve healthy diets, reduce NCDs, and improve climate resilience in small island developing states. The last few years, my friends, have been devastating for SIDS as we endured multiple overlapping crises, the climate crisis, and the COVID-19 pandemic, the global economic downturn, global instability due to wars and threats of wars a fuel that continues to ignite unhealthy lifestyles within these small island developing states. The impact on the health of citizens of SIDS is further strained by the increase in poverty, inequality, unemployment, lack of opportunities, lack of investment, and the deterioration of our lands and water, water resources. The mental health of SIDS, my friends, are at risk. So too is the increase in non-communicable diseases. Excellencies, this might not be such a good thing in the long run, for me to say, but SIDS have, hist have a history of, of, of teaching and working with the outside world to challenge and shape solutions and influence the world's agenda to advance sustainable development and resilience. We have done it with climate as an example. The fourth SIDS conference that will be hosted in Antigua and Barbuda in May of 2024, under the theme of charting the course towards resilience prosperity offers an opportunity 
yet again for SIDS and the international community to work together in, on a, a, a range of issues, including agro-food system approaches in advancing our needs. Friends, my sustainable agro-food system, and I am deliberate in, in stating sustainable before agro-food system because the sustainability of agro-food systems is a critical component in addressing climate-driven social and ecological disasters. As global leaders, it is how, <clears throat> how, it is how we refine the interaction of humanity and our environment that's most important. In relationship to small island developing states, we must focus on the quality of our food system, the sufficiency of our food system, the distribution of our food system, and how we move our agro-food systems into healthy lifestyles that support healthy communities in these small island developing states. At the Fort Sitz Conference, we will identify the issues and the drivers of, of unhealthy lifestyles that are unique within SIDS. We urge the international community to get ready for actionable outcome, including mobilizing resources and collaborating with non-traditional partners. As a global community, excellencies, there should be no more delays in critically examining how we com comprehensively address the increase of non-communicable diseases within small island developing states. Colleagues, I believe that agro-food systems approach have the, have the potential and opportunity to positively impact and improve the health and well-being of the and the environment within the, the lands of the small island developing states and impact the lives of the citizens of these states. Let's stand ready for action. Let's do it together. Let's do it. I thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Webson. I would note uh, uh, that Antigua Barbuda will be the host of the 2024 SIDS conference, and we thank Ambassador Webson for all his efforts um, towards uh, to a successful conference and how he shared with us about the overlapping crisis and the impacts on, on the economies, societies, and environment of SIDS, and also the importance of agri-food systems transformation as a means to achieve uh, the global goals. Before I turn the floor uh, to His Excellency uh, José Filomeno de Carvalho, Ambassador of Cabo Verde to the European Union and Chair of the OACPS Forum, SIDS Forum, I wish to uh, look here with our colleagues and see if anybody would like uh, to provide some short remarks before uh, I pass the floor to the Ambassador. I don't see anybody, um, last chance. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Um, I, I'll now uh, turn to uh, Ambassador José Vidomeno de Carvalho, Ambassador Cabo Verde to the European Union and Chair of the OACPS SIDS Forum. Embaixador, a palavra é sua. Muito obrigado, Angélica. I see everybody is shy today. Um, excellencies, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. I am honored to speak today on behalf of the OACPS SIDS Forum as the incumbent chair during the SID Solutions Dialogue. As one of the closing interventions, I trust you will join me 
in commending the previous speakers who have highlighted innovative food systems approaches to improve food and nutritional security in and by seeds, and as a consequence, promoting healthy and resilient communities for small island developing states. Permit me also to commend the FAO for organizing this dialogue and for so ably demonstrating collaboration with the OACPS and with others. It, it allows us all to exchange views, share knowledge, and deepen our understanding of the complex interplay between food security and nutrition, health and well-being, and climate change. And uh, importantly, for highlighting the very unique challenges faced by the 39 member states of the OACPS who are SIDS. SIDS place a premium on achieving food and nut nutrition security. Our unique challenges and specificities place an, an onerous and often overwhelming burden on us to ensure that food and nutrition nutrition security is more than just ensuring an adequate supply of food. For it needs to be safe, nutritious, and culturally appropriate. It is also about how we do this in the current context of the global public crisis of food, fuel, and fertilizer insecurity, and the triple planetary crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution. In fact, the current climate crisis is not just a crisis for seeds. It is an emergency that we find ourselves at the front line of its impacts and uh, escalating threats. These make it much harder to ensure the health, well-being, and resilience of all of our citizens uh, is maintained. As we reflect on the insights gained from this dialogue, I want to emphasize a few uh, key takeaway messages to achieve resilient and inclusive food systems for seeds. As already mentioned, climate change poses an immediate and escalating threat to seeds' food and nutritional security. The food systems transformation approach is a critical pathway that goes beyond a siloed approach to address multiple policy objectives, such as healthy diets, climate action, and sustainable use and, and conversation of our biodiversity. This must entail investing in a climate resilience, resilient agriculture and sustainable fisheries and fostering innovation and technology transfer to improve productivity and provide quality food for ourselves as well as for others. We need to implement policy interventions and investments in collaboration with the private sector and civil society to promote food self-sufficiency increase sustainable food production and reduce imports as well as ensure we optimize sustainable economic returns. We see that partnerships and collaboration are key. 
we can build the resilience food, resilient food systems by working together and collaborating with the international partners to leverage the strengths of multiple stakeholders and ensure that seeds wealth of traditional knowledge and innovation are important ingredients. Above all, financing is critical for implementing the enabling policies for sustainable and inclusive food systems. We believe financing for seeds should largely draw from public financial resources, including bilateral and multilateral development assistance, as well as private finance sources. In this regard, you may ask what the OACPS is doing. I can say with confidence that OACPS's singular ambition is to support its six regions, 79 countries, and 1.3 billion peoples to achieve sustainability and build resilience. Excellencies, we will recall that OACPS seeks forums efforts to develop an OACPS multidimensional vulnerability index in support to the UN high-level panel for the MVI as an objective, complementary alternative to GNI per capita, which we know is the only instrument used to determine access to concessional finance. We know that it has effective, effectively locked out many of our vulnerable seeds members who are facing unimaginable impacts on climate change and other exogenous shocks from being able to access concessional finance. Besides our support for the Bridgetown Initiative 2.0 is uh, an equivocal to reform the international financial architecture and overhaul the multilateral development banks to make them relevant and fit for today's circumstances and importantly provide needed respite to vulnerable countries, including seeds to the climate emergency. As manda mandated by our Council of Ministers, the OACPS is also organizing the SEEDS-led Resource Mobilization Conference, which aims to secure financial resources to implement MDCs. This is planned to be held in 2024, prior to the fourth International SEEDS Conference to be held 27 to 20 May in Antigua and Barbuda, we welcome partners to join us in achieving its objectives. The OACPS is also establishing a food systems transformation mechanism as our policy governance arrangement. Once established, it will provide a space for policy dialogue, cooperation and collaboration with technical regional organizations involved in food system transformation. This will facilitate knowledge sharing, co-learning and provide advice and technical expertise across and between our regions and the many stakeholders. Excellencies, these are just examples of uh, demonstrating our commitment to seeds in supporting them to realize their food systems transformation agenda. The road and sea lanes ahead may be bumpy and choppy, but so is our determination to make a difference. And as a chair of the OACPS SIDS Forum, I extend an invitation to the FAO 
and all our partners to join us in our endeavors to seed to ensure we build healthy and resilient societies. We, I thank you. I, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency, um, for highlighting the opportunity of, of, of efforts such as these um, to exchange views to address the unique challenges faced by SIDS, particularly in light of uh, current global circumstances. Um, Your Excellency, you underscored um, how climate is an existential threat uh, for SIDS and the importance of uh, climate resilient agriculture, sustainable fisheries, and aquaculture and other um, efforts um, to uh, support SIDS. Um, there was also, you also stressed um, the need to bring other actors into the mix uh, and, and uh, to increase um, food production in a sustainable manner. Um, the importance of partnerships were reiterated to build uh, resilient agri-food systems. And also, um, a lot of the point of the SID Solutions Dialogue is precisely what you mentioned about bringing to bear local solutions from SIDS. Uh, and last but not least, you shared OACPS efforts in uh, in investment and resource mobilization, and you alluded to the conference, the resource mobilization conference in 2024. Uh, you have said uh, the road ahead is uh, bumpy, uh, and uh, I think all of us in the room and online are willing to go to this bumpy road together, um, because that way we can all move forward in support of, of SIDS. As we reach the end of this dialogue, it's my pleasure to hand the floor to Mr. Charles Bolico, the African SIDS coordinator at FAO, to share with us an initiative, upcoming initiative. Uh, Mr. Bolico, you have the floor. Excellencies, colleagues, ladies, gentlemen, greetings. Please forgive my attire. Right now, I'm deep in the field in southern Madagascar for the planting season. But today, I want to talk to you about the FAO African Seed Program, of which I have been given the privilege to be the manager. And the team has done quite some work in each country. We have revived the inter-regional technical network with members from academia, from the civil society, from private organizations, but also from the public sector. We have also undertaken a mapping of all the initiatives that are ongoing inside each country, including the actors in agri-food systems. Now we know what's going on. And we have also organized a national workshop in each country to find out what is it that this FA African Seed Program can focus on. And we have these priorities. Now the time has come to build a program. And we want to do this together. This is why we are organizing a high-level event on African seeds. It will take place on 7 and 8 November, that is next week, in Mauritius. Relevant ministers from each African seed have confirmed their participation. During this high-level event, there will be a minister's conclave there will be exchanges between ministers and partners. Now we need to come together, all of us, to agree on the direction to take. We need to build a program for all our African seeds. What are your ideas? Do you have any suggestions? What can we do better? What can we do more of? We need to hear from you. This is why I count on your participation in this event, online or in person. Remember, 7 and 8 November in Mauritius next week. See you there.
you in in the room we'll ensure that the um, the link arrives uh, to use because we welcome all of you to participate in this um like all the things um this event is coming to an end i wish to just quickly uh thank our host um thank our speakers uh, thank our audience and also all the teams uh, uh, that have been working behind the scenes um, to make this event a success. So with that, I uh, bid you a good day, a good evening, uh, and that depends where in the world you are, but I wish you all good luck and uh, let's uh, go together on this bumpy road uh, to make uh, a lot of uh, change for um, Small Island Wellbeing Days. Thank you very much.